Well, here we are in the third day of unleavened bread of the Sabbath, and time continues to move on. I was reflecting on this yesterday that I remember some of the early years of the days of unleavened bread and traveling uh, for distances. And just as I wrote last night in my letter, just a lot of memories flood through. And one of the memories that came to mind was a minister many years ago took a survey. We used to do this uh, in a fellowship that I served in where we would send out, or we were supposed to send out, a survey of what the congregation thought about things and wanted it. So a minister many years ago took a survey and he asked his congregation what type of sermon they liked best. He thought it would help him in planning his sermon. Okay? Well, he found a startling response from the survey. Here's the three most common answers. Number one was short. <laughs> number two was humorous. And number three was loud. And so uh, this morning, I'll do my best to do one out of three. You'll need to figure out which one. Um, years, years ago, and this is a true story, uh, before I walked up once to give a sermon, I, uh, my name had just been announced. Uh, a young person, actually I was walking up, a young person in the front row said audibly, please don't let him go too long. So I've been going a little longer recently. I'm going to try to curb that. And this morning uh, we didn't have a, a first message, so I hope I won't just decide I have to go ahead and use the full time. We'll use what's needed, but... I trust we're all alert and awake after hopefully a relaxed Friday evening, uh, perhaps getting to bed a little bit earlier, maybe. Uh, I know some of you had a, quite a, a bit of a drive here to come today, and some of you on the webcast, I uh, appreciate you doing that. I appreciate you being with us, and appreciate all of you here uh, that make that sacrifice. Um, I also realize that many of you on the webcast, because we do... Uh, have a, a way to tabulate how many. We don't know who or where necessarily, but we do know how many. Uh, you have many choices, and uh, we're grateful just to simply be able to serve you in this way. So welcome and thank you uh, for being part of this as we worship God. Well, I do plan to end on time, and uh, hopefully that prod will keep us alert. If not, I'm sure my, my dear sound person, my wife over here, will be uh, going, <laughs> you know, uh, I remember a man one time, I won't mention his name because he's long deceased, but uh, he said, if as a minister or a pastor or a teacher, you're not watching your watch, you're the only one that isn't. So uh, what we're going to discuss this morning and today is too important for us not to absorb. It just is. And so I've asked this question over the years, but it's worth replication. I'm going to ask several questions, but this, this, this one I want you to stop and think about. If the churches of this world, all the churches out here, and right here where we live, there are many. I can drive down the road here, and there's, I've lost count, and we've done it so many times. There's five, six, seven good-sized churches of various denominations. If they were given the opportunity to place the Passover and what they thought was the correct order in relation to God's plan, where would they place the Passover? Have you thought about it? And if they understood and knew that unleavened bread meant to come out of sin, where would they place it in relationship to Christ's sacrifice on the cross? And if they understood that unleavened bread meant to come out of sin and Passover meant Christ's sacrifice, where then would they place unleavened bread? What are the chances? What are the chances of a good, this Sunday I believe is Easter Sunday. Is it this Sunday, right? What are the chances of a good Easter sunrise observing Christian putting Passover and unleavened bread in the correct order. They probably would put unleavened bread before Passover. There's a great 
hoax, if you want to use that word, it's a bit strong. It's been perpetrated on this world. And the notion is that Christ's death on the cross was the completion of God's plan rather than the start. We teach from the Word of God this living, breathing, inspired Word of God, if you still own one, that Christ's death is just the beginning of God's plan. But if you go and listen carefully and read, most churches would have you believe that it ended at Calvary. They will teach that all you need to do is accept the past events of Christ's death and salvation is guaranteed. And so I want to talk about this today because it ties in with where we are and where we're going and where we've been. Why does God place the days of unleavened bread, which do represent coming out of sin, after the Passover, which represents the forgiving of sin? We just have finished observing the Passover service a few days ago on Tuesday evening, the 7th of April. A commemoration of the fact that Christ died for our sins and our guilt has been forgiven, and then we will then during these seven days, which we are now, observe and follow these, needing to come out of sin. Why is that? Because strange as it may seem, to many religious ears, it was not done all for us at Calvary. Just accepting Jesus Christ does not in any way guarantee our salvation. You know that? It's a beginning. Just the start. In fact, until you were baptized and have God's Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands, in one sense, you're not even in the race. But once you are baptized and have God's Holy Spirit, then you're up to the starting line. And now you have a long distance race or better marathon ahead of you. When my wife and I were dating, she frequently ran 5Ks, 10Ks, 2Ks, didn't run any KKKs, but she ran a lot of Ks. <laughs> and I remember uh, one time, I think it was at the Rose Bowl, she ran, and I just would go to the different points, and she's still just thump, 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 going along. And I'm like, this is nine and a half too many Ks for me. But it's a marathon. And if you run it like a 30, 40 yard dash or a 440, you're in trouble, okay? Let's go to uh, Colossians 2.14. Because this is the favorite verse in mainstream Christianity to show that the law of God was nailed to that cross. They will turn to this verse, and when you talk about the necessity to obey God's law, and they will say, see, it was nailed to the cross. And they will say it was contrary, it was against us. God took it out of the way and he nailed that old law to the cross. I have startled a number of people who said, well, there's this verse in the New Testament that says and shows the law was nailed to the cross and done away. And I'll say, oh, you mean Colossians 2.14? And they'll say, how did you know? How did you know that? I'll say, well, I do read my Bible on rare occasion. Since it's my job, my calling, I believe, and, and so do you, all of us. Let's go back, brethren, to verse 14, and friends, and let's read it. And I want to ask anyone in, on the webcast, email me, call me, contact me, or here. I want to ask anyone here or watching, show me the word law in this verse. Let's read it. Colossians 2 and verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. I'm reading from the, the uh, original uh, 1611 authorized version. It's not original, but the authorized version translation. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, 
took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Where does it say the law of God? Anywhere. It doesn't. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm just, we need to understand some of the basic teachings of the word of God that are not taught or misconstrued or flat out wrong. That's what's being taught. Some will say, well, ordinance is the same as law. All right, even if ordinances is law, what's blotted out? Ordinances, ordinances is not being blotted out. If you look at it, you know, I can go back to a third or fourth grade English class. I wasn't the brightest stick in the stack when it came to English and diagramming and all that, but I did learn some things, and an understanding of what was being blotted out was not ordinances, but the handwriting. And so, it's not what it says. Is that what it says? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, which modifies handwriting. So what was nailed to the cross were not the ordinances of God, but the handwriting was. Now, with that, most people say, all right, I get that. Okay, I, we can agree on that. But what in the world is handwriting? What does that mean? Especially now that most people don't. They text and use computer. I, I don't write very much by hand anymore. I'll send a note now and then. Or make notes if somebody's, well, some people do, okay. <laughs> he just turned around showed me his page. See, I'm taking notes. <clears throat> it comes from the Greek word chirographon, meaning better translated for understanding a note of guilt. A note of guilt. For example, the death penalty. The Greek is pretty exact here in graphic. Whenever you sin and you break God's law, the law of God, it is as if you are signing your name to your own death warrant. That signing of your name to your death warrant, that penalty of death is what Jesus Christ took to the stake with him. That note of guilt is due to ordinances. Now, what are those ordinances? We need to understand this and explain it before we get into the body of the sermon. The note of guilt is due to ordinances. Let's go down a little bit in the chapter to verse 20 and 21. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. What's that mean? Well, it's talking about asceticism. Things are sin. Alcohol is sin. Sex, except for having children, is sin. That's an ascetic idea. It's not talking about the ordinance of God, but the ordinances of men. M-E-N. Humans. Follow the ordinances of men, which is sin, then you are signing your own death warrant. And brethren and friends and those connecting, there were only three things nailed to that cross revealed in Scripture, explained, inspired, recorded. Three things. This is important. Number one, the body of Christ. Okay? And we would all agree on that. The second thing is the penalty of death that results from sin. The penalty of death that results from sin. And the third and last thing, the sign stating who was there. And if you take all the scriptures together, it read, translated to English the best I can, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That's it. Three things. The only three things. Not the law of God. And let's go on a little further as we lay the groundwork for the remainder of this message today. In Romans chapter 3, let's go there please, Romans chapter 3. I know there are going to be some that say, I have never heard this or read this. Maybe not. And you may disagree, and you're entitled to disagree, but it's what God says. Romans 3 verse 21.
But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all, upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You have and I have. And everyone here has. Being justified freely by his grace to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation or a go-between through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Did we read that? The sins that are past. When, when you and I... And when you go into the water at baptism and God forgives your sins and you come up out of it, he forgives your sins that are past up to that point. It is not carte blanche to sin in the future. It is not a license to sin in the future. It only deals with the past and up to the point you go under the water. It is not permission to continue to sin. In Romans chapter 6, over just a couple pages, Paul continues to talk about this. Romans 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law. And we might, the original says the penalty of the law, but under grace, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. That is a very strong, powerful statement. And here is what it means. Shall we sin that grace may abound? What kind of, sorry, infantile reasoning is that? How could anyone possibly think that's what Paul is saying? Because now that you're under grace, you can go out and sin, and everything will just be hunky-dory and okay. It's all right. You can do whatever. Because Christ did it all for you. And he gives you permission to go out and do what is wrong and sin? No. And, and friends and brethren, we are admonished not to sin. Yes, after we come under or being under grace. Do we appreciate that? Can, can do I, do you, do we understand that, what I'm saying because if you've been in one of the good portion of the denominations available out there, and I mean immersed in it, you're going to be facing some conflict right now. Because we are admonished not to sin after being under grace. God says, do not sin, otherwise you can fall from grace. And if we can sin after grace, and the Bible says you can, then the law is also in force. When there is no law, or where there is no law, there is no transgression of the law. And if you can still sin under grace, then the law must exist. Would you agree? Now, I wanted to catch a few of these important verses to show you that Christ's sacrifice merely removes your past guilt. It doesn't make you or me righteous. It only makes you neutral. It removes the death penalty. It removes sin as far as claiming your eternal life. The examples of our ancient forefathers, how this works and operates. Most importantly, accepting Christ does not remove present and future sin. And you can just do whatever you want. Do we understand that? It never gives us permission to sin. Nor does it forgive future sins. That is why... The days of leavened bread come after Passover. Let me repeat that. That is why the days of unleavened bread that we're keeping right now come after Passover. Now, I hope we realize that there's indeed a lot we must do before God will give us eternal life. In Matthew chapter 19, let's go over there. I don't think I'm going to have thousands of people wanting to connect to this sermon online and because uh, they want to follow it. I don't think so. But God says, 
We need to follow what he says to do. Okay, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16 is an interesting statement because the world is seized upon this question. It says, And behold, one came and said, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may get or have eternal life? And their whole method of operation, modus operandi, if you say that, is come on down this sawdust aisle or this aisle and give your heart to the Lord. And sometimes they add in your pocketbook to me. You know, come on down. Give your heart to the Lord. All you have to do is accept Jesus Christ and you have instantaneous salvation with a big hallelujah and an amen, which isn't wrong to say either. But they just want to have to do one thing so they can have salvation. Now, I don't want to have to spend a lot of time in it. Yes, we, I do want to spend a lot of time. But people say, I, I want to just do this. What one good thing do I have to do? Get it over with. And I'm done. They want to get it out of the way as fast as they can so they can give their heart to the Lord and it's all done. Moses is an example we're going to look at. But before we do that, I want to remind us, most want instant salvation. Go to the store sometime and see how many things there you can buy that are instant. Well, you don't have to do anything except open it, put it in the microwave, you know, maybe add water. You don't have to do anything. One of my favorite non-food items <laughs> as a young person was ramen noodles. Really bad for you, I think. Am I wrong? But you know, I, you, you didn't. You could be pretty brainless and make that a meal. You just added water and turned the fire on it until it got bigger and puffed up, and then you ate it and it did that inside your stomach too, I guess. But they want one step salvation. In verse seventeen, and he said, "Why do you call me good? There's none good but one. That is God, meaning the Father. But if you will enter into life, here we go. Keep." The commandments. Keep the commandments. This man that was asking him this question, he was well ahead of his time. Verse 17, he should have been in one of the denominations out there, uh, one of the Western Christian churches separate, you know, maybe the Roman Catholic Church, Reformation, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, I'm not picking on them, but their teachings are out there. They're, they're not hiding it, what they believe. Of course Christ was good, but Christ said, what are the reasons you call me good? In verse 18, he said unto him, which? Jesus said, you shall do no murder, you shall not commit adultery, not steal, not bear false witness. Now what are those? You recognize them? Recognize any of those? In verse 18, Christ said, if you want eternal life, he had to go throughout his life keeping the commandments. In other words, the part of life you must live in order to have salvation. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. There, this is a verse that there's often uh, an overlooked couple words, or at least one in this verse, that we many don't want to read. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author of, and the finisher of our faith, who for by the joy, as we talked about on the first day of unleavened bread, that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's a very often overlooked one word in this verse that makes a world of difference. It separates nearly all the world's religions and those true followers of Jesus Christ and God. The ecclesia of God. Christ is not only the beginner and author of our faith, but the finisher. Baptism is just a beginning. The beginning of a lifelong trek of putting sin 
out of our lives. Becoming perfect. Become you therefore perfect. Recognize that scripture? As God in Christ is perfect. This is what many of the professing Christian world have been blinded to. They have lost sight of the second step in God's plan. That is, listen carefully, that you and I must remove, not just have the penalty of sin removed, we must, through Christ, remove sin itself from our lives. And the only way you can do that is by eating of that true bread and through a continual repentance and relationship, God's spirit, his faith, he lives in us, and the old man, woman, dies daily. And a transformation takes place. And all that happens at baptism is God removes all the sins you've committed in the past. When you come out of the water and receive God's Spirit, you're essentially the same person you were before you went in the water. Some have become very disillusioned. They thought they ought to, once they came out of the they baptized, they were perfect. They walk out the front door, maybe. <laughs> I had a man call me one time. Like 10 minutes later, he'd driven home from where he was and you know he said somebody cut me off in traffic and he said I shook my fist and told him off and I caught myself and I thought wait I'm not supposed to do that anymore I'm baptized now all that God did is remove the guilt he's not removed sin out of your life it's still there and you probably won't get through that first day after baptism without sinning again we will not get through any day of our lives after baptism that we're not going to sin at least once. You may say, no, wait a minute. I didn't sin yesterday. Dig deep. Bet you did. I know I did. All right? I've had some say, I went all week without sinning. Okay, you know. Give me something to stick you that's real sharp. See if you say, ouch. Even after we are converted. Let's take a look at a leader I mentioned here. God chose for the ancient Israelites. We're here in Hebrews 12. Let's go back to Hebrews 11 and verse 24, since we're right here. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, about 40 years old, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Well, that's a big statement. Is it not? Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Now this is before, even before God began to work with him as far as God revealing who he was going to, how he was going to use Moses. Moses came to understand this and began to see this. And he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses chose to give up sinful pleasure, fine wine, women, music, all of the wonderful things of Egypt, rulership, wealth, because he wanted to please God. Moses then began to go through the process of putting sin out of his life long before the Israelites were to act out the event. Moses did that in his own life also figuratively long before God chose the nation of Israel to figuratively lead them out of sin. Putting leaven out of our homes for the days of unleavened bread you know, I sat this morning at the breakfast table and ate some unleavened bread. And we talked about that in the sermon a few days ago, why we eat leavened bread every day and should. It teaches us as we think about it that after accepting Jesus Christ, we are obligated to look for and find sin in our lives and get rid of it. Yes, after accepting Jesus Christ's sacrifice for sin. Now, none of this is new, not new truth. 
But there have been some among us, brethren, who didn't understand this. I can go back many different times over my years. Now, to a, a, a I just, it's there, to a Protestant mind or, or thinking, this would be startling information, a revelation, if you will, coming out of sin? Why, Christ did it all for me. He did it all. Hallelujah. I don't have any more problems. I don't have to wrestle with the consequence of sin. Christ did it all for me. Let's go back and let's look at the story of our ancient forefathers. Exodus chapter 12. Now, I thought about just at this point playing the Ten Commandments, the movie. <laughs> Rather than showing you the verses, I thought about showing you the movie, but it's really wrong. I would really then break one of those first three options that we had at the beginning. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 40, and these are verses that many don't even read the Old Testament. That Old Testament, that don't apply. Every word of God, the whole package, the whole book, the whole enchilada, as they used to say, the whole thing. Exodus chapter 12, verse 40. Let's read some of these verses. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. Now, in the movie by Cecil B. DeMille's with Charlton Heston playing Moses, I think it was 1956, somewhere in there, 55. I mentioned this a couple days ago. The movie was quite flawed. It's very entertaining. It has some information. It's inspiring, but it's just flat wrong in some of the parts. It was very flawed. You know, I, I, one of my favorites, um, Moses, supposedly in love with this Egyptian woman, went down to Midian for 40 years. And when he came back, I looked, I remember as a kid looking and thinking, man, she hasn't aged a day. I don't know about you, but I can go back 40 years and all of you can, and I've aged. Maybe some of you haven't, but I'd say you have. The makeup must have been pretty good back then, too. Let's read the exact account so we don't get confused. They were not slaves for 430 years. Understand the difference. Verse 41. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, that the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. 430 years exactly to the day. You know what? Isn't it interesting how God always does things on time? You think he knows when he's coming back and why and what's going to happen? Oh, well, Christ, I think, should we come back now? It's getting pretty bad. Well, I know we recorded all this stuff in the Bible. It has to happen, and some are jumping the gun. There's a lot of things that have to happen yet. So I can tell you he's not coming back in six months. Not because I'm a prophet, but his word says these things must first take place. Now, how they happen exactly, and will it be perfectly in the Scripture? We, we think we understand it, but boy, we've always thought we understood it. And I joke about this, but I'm old enough to go back. In 72, we're through. 73, we flee. 74, there is no more. And I thought 75, we're still alive. What happened? And now we're at 2020, and I'm a grandpa. And I'm older. Some of you may remember when I had dark hair. And I had hair. Don't laugh. But 430 years exactly to the day from the time of the confirming of the covenant to the night to be observed when the Israelites walked out of the land of Egypt out of captivity on the 15th of the first month exactly 430 years to the day. In Genesis chapter 17, let's go back. Verse 1, I think it's Genesis 17, verse 1 that I want. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty, El Shaddai God. Walk before me and be you therefore perfect, wholehearted, right? 
And Galatians tells us the same thing. Abraham was told to be perfect, to get rid of sin. He was told by God, become like I am. And we go down to verse 9 and 10, and God said to Abraham, you shall keep my covenant, therefore you and your seed after you and your generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between you and me and your seed after you. Every man among you shall be circumcised. Now, apparently from Jewish tradition, we find that the covenant was confirmed on the 15th day of the first month, the best we can tell. Abraham was told to become perfect, that he had to keep putting sin out and putting God in. And here we go, listen carefully, to never give up. And friends, that is the meaning of unleavened bread. To never give up. Abraham associated this day with coming out of sin and becoming perfect 430 years later on the exact same day God led Israel out of Egypt. In order for us to realize to do that today, we don't need to be circumcised physically, but baptized and receive God's Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and as difficult as baptism and receiving God's Spirit and becoming perfect is, I'm not trying to, and I've gotten trouble by one person years ago for using this word, but it's in the Bible. Circumcision was not easy either. I remember my son the day he was circumcised. I'm glad he was only eight days old. I'll never forget that day. I'm not going to describe it. I'm not going to go into it because there's no need. I'm thankful he won't remember it. Can you imagine how dedicated Abraham's servants were as adults without anesthesia? Just a good pebble to bite down on? Painful process. God used a type of spiritual circumcision of baptism and conversion. In the New Testament, becoming like God is a painful process, isn't it? It's not easy. It's done under duress. You want to know why? Because human beings don't want to change. We have made God in our own image, and we resist changing him. We don't want to conform to the way he is because it hurts. You know what's bothering so many people right now? They can't go do what they want to do. Well, you pretty much can, but you can't. You know, around here, the beaches are closed, the restaurants are closed, the stores are closed. I thought yesterday, I'll go up and I need a new pair of tennis shoes. Closed for the next three, four weeks. All across Alabama. So you can't do it. People say, I don't like it. Well, I've traveled around the world and most of the places I've been, you don't just go do whatever you want at any time of day and open and stores aren't, aren't open. Human beings don't want to change. In Exodus chapter 12, let's go back to uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 42. <clears throat> it is a night to be much observed unto the Lord, bringing them out from the land of Egypt, this is the night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. We're spiritual Israel. It's part of the reason we continue to keep it. The night to be observed, celebration, we celebrated the next evening after the Passover. Okay? After the Passover. I hope it was joyous. A time of joy, thankfulness, reflecting on what God has done for us. The Israelites had been in bondage for about 250 years. Walking out, they were free. It was the first time in generations they were walking out free, happy, celebrating. I remember, this goes back a long time now, when our United States hostages came back from Iran. I remember watching them kiss the ground, relieved from captivity. Few things for us should equal the joy of getting rid of sin. 
Have you ever looked at it from that point of view? It's hard while you're doing it, but once you do it, yeah! Right? John Denver. Remember that man? It wasn't his real name. I forget what his German or Dutch name was, but he sang a song, A Rocky Mountain High. I could sing it for you, but not a drug-related high, a natural, normal high. How many of you remember Jackie Gleason? Remember him? Right? How sweet it is. I still see him saying that. I miss some of those old shows. I guess you can find them somewhere. How joyous to look back and see you have conquered this sin with God's help. You look at a cigarette and you say, ha, never again. I control you. You look at the large amounts of alcohol. Maybe, maybe instead of water, this is vodka. It's water, by the way. No more. I'm not going to drink it anymore. Uh, not the water. No more alcohol. Right? The days of slamming a 12-pack when I get home from work, some would say, I haven't done that. Not doing it anymore. Done. I control that. I don't care if your name is vodka, beer, wine, or... No, we won't go there. I control you. I was going to say fireball whiskey. Because <laughs> that's addictive. People love that. That's so good. If you have a tendency to eat too much, or maybe too many desserts. Now he went from preaching to meddling, right? I control you, German chocolate cake. No more. Right? A guy I was talking to yesterday said, you know, I can sit and eat three quarters of a box of matzos. <laughs> well, maybe that's a little much. I'm only going to have one twice, or whatever they call it. How satisfying is it to be reviled by someone, and because of the Holy Spirit of God, Christ in you, you say nothing back. I remember doing that one time. I was really under fire. Uh, it was a horrible experience, but didn't say anything. Don't you have anything to say? I said, no. Nope. Didn't. Someone's nasty to you? You bite their tongue? You bite your tongue, you don't say anything back. You don't stoop down to their level. That gives me and us great satisfaction knowing that God in us helps us not to sin. The night to when much observed came after Passover because it was a happy occasion. The Israelites were happy and celebrated, but there was a problem. It didn't last. Exodus 14 and verse 8 says, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. The initial release from bondage, they were on this high, you know, uh, the Hava Nagila, where the Jewish dance perhaps originated. They'd been petitioning God for centuries. You ever felt like that? Every day you say, Father, God, Jesus Christ, please help me. And one day he says, okay. Or maybe he's been helping, you didn't recognize it. They had been petitioning God for centuries. The children had been born, they grew up, and they died in captivity. Finally, in about what I can guess, 1743 B.C., God smote the Egyptians and delivered them to freedom. They were no longer paying the direct penalty of bondage. They were no longer under the heavy hand of the Egyptians. And by the way, Egypt is a type of sin. Here's a question. Just because they were no longer under Egyptian rule, did that mean Egypt didn't exist? Because we are free from the penalty of sin at baptism, does it mean sin no longer exists? There's a very great lesson as we follow the story of the Israelites. Verse 9. We read this the other day. The Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, overtook them encamping by the sea beside Pihahiroth before Baal-Zephon. So as soon as the Israelites were released, guess what? Egypt was after them. You know, Amenhotep II, Pharaoh, type of Satan the devil. Why do we have crises after baptism? 
And in our walk, nobody ever have crises. Nobody has them, right? Just me. Problems. We're not superhuman to avoid sin in the future. That's why God gives us his Holy Spirit. Sin is still there. In verse 10, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. Behold, the Egyptians marched, and they were flat scared to death, and the children of Israel cried out unto God. So Pharaoh, a type of Satan, the devil, was in charge of the forces of sin. And when you're pursued after conversion, Satan is a type of Pharaoh. He's suffered a loss, and he's going to come after you. One sinner repents, the angels in heaven rejoice. Satan suffered a loss. He's going to group his forces. He can come after you. In verse 14, verse 1, or chapter 14, verse 1, Okay, there it is. Chapter 14, verse 1, we'll just uh, refer you to it. They didn't travel the well-traveled route called the way of the Philistines. They didn't take the major trade route. God told them, go out straight across the desert, off the main trail, off the well-traveled route. Here's another lesson. Leaving sin is never easy. It's going to take all your energy. More than that, it takes the help of God. Only he can bring you totally out of sin. Now, Pihahiroth, we talked about this, was a mountain range made escape by land impossible to the south and to the west. You had the mountains, the Red Sea directly to their east, which is about eight miles across. Never mind what the idiotic scholars, some of them have said. It was the Reed Sea, and they just lifted and tiptoed across. The water was only ankle deep. Sorry. I watched that one time. I just had to turn it off. It was the Red Sea. Pharaoh was coming from the north. They were boxed in. Now, Ewell Brenner said in the Ten Commandments, I caught this line, their God's not much of a military man. So they were boxed in. Sound familiar? You ever felt like that? You're boxed in. You can't. There's no way out. I've felt like that many times. No job, no money. Tomorrow the utility's going off. The children are sick. The puppy's chewed up everything nice. He's not housebroken. Husband or wife on your case. No way out. Problems everywhere. That's where the Israelites were brought by God. Sin was coming out after them. There was no escape on their own. And what are we trying to do now? This is what will give you fear trying to figure out how you can fix all these problems in the world on your own. We keep trying. And verse 11 and 12, as we go on here, listen to, listen to these joyous, celebrating Israelites dancing in the streets just a little while before. And they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, you brought us out here to die in this wilderness. Why have you dealt with us to carry us out of Egypt? Is it not this the word that we did tell you in Egypt? Remember what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we can serve the Egyptians. It had been better to serve them that we should die out here in this wilderness. For 250 years, the Israelites said, Leave us alone. We love these folks. We love these taskmasters. Is that what they said? In Exodus 1, verse 13, go check it out. Exodus 1, 13, the Egyptians made the Israelites serve with rigor. I kind of think of the movie The Office Space years ago. I'm going to need you to come in Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. I need you to do me a favor. And You know what? You go home. Sleep, eat, shower? No, I just need you to work. In Exodus 2, verse 23, God heard by reason of their bondage. He heard them groaning. He intervened. He remembered his covenant with Abraham. The Israelites prayed for a deliverer to come. God brought them out of Egypt. Egypt started coming after them. 
They wanted to go back to sin because coming out of sin was hard. They simply wanted to give up. And after all the duress, God did not immediately deliver them. Look at their reaction. The going got tough, sin still threatened, and what did they do? They got discouraged. If getting away from sin is this hard, maybe I'd be better off back in sin, not trying to resist it. They wanted to give up. Only one week before they had been rejoicing for coming out of almost three centuries of captivity. Here's what we learn. They wanted one step liberty and peace. They wanted it done like that. True freedom, liberty and peace comes through individual work, patience, and takes time. It doesn't happen overnight, and we must never give up. We have some in this world who will gladly accept the blood of Jesus Christ in deliverance, but when the going gets tough, they want to just give up and go back to bondage. You and I are going to experience difficulties, problems. Sin beats us up. It's still present in our lives. We get discouraged, going back into bondage just like the Israelites did. One of our adversaries' favorite ploys and ways of doing things is to make you want to return to the life of sin that you were called out of. Some live obedient to God's law for 5, 10, 25, 30, 50 years, and then they leave God and go back to the life God called them out of. And in Exodus 14, the children of Israel said, verse 13, what are we supposed to do, Moses? God never intended for the Israelites to have to fight and war and never have to pick up a spear. The only reason God started to direct them later on to fight was they continued to rebel against God and he would not fight all their battles for them. There was no need for the Israelites to pick up a sword and kill anyone. And that's something we need to think about. If you're going to protect yourself and everything else you have, I ask you, I implore you, show me in Scripture. Well, that's what you're supposed to do. There was no need for the Israelites to pick up a sword and kill anyone. God said, stand still and I will do it. You have seen my mighty hand Ten times. Can you trust me once more? Are you and I any different? They refused to believe and they got depressed. In verse 14, God did not need the Israelites to fight for him. He would fight for them. God intended for them to be the army of Israel without having to raise a hand. Read it. In verse 21, what happened? God opened up the Red Sea right before their, line, their lives. I've prayed this for many. God Give us a Red Sea miracle. My wife and I had one. We've had many over the years, but we had one 16, 18 months ago. Nowhere to turn. And God gave us that. He allowed the dry ground to be walked on. Pharaoh was held back by this huge ball of fire. And you can say what you want about Pharaoh, but he wasn't too bright. The army wasn't too bright. I think I might have been, I don't know, after seeing what he did, said, hey, let's turn the chariot and go back and think about this. Let's, let's reconvene and talk. But they had their gods too, didn't they? The magician said, what do you think? The magicians tested the wind. They cut open a lizard or a frog and said, I think it's safe. What led Pharaoh to do this? He saw all of this with his own two eyes. You have to wonder. Brother, too many of us today, we don't believe we don't have the faith of Jesus Christ in us like we need to. Sometimes we're not willing to work hard at our problems and trust God to deliver us. We pray, we study, and then we wait for an answer, and we put it in God's hands. And as modern Israelites, we must have the same attitude of what God wants, not go back to bondage. If it's so much trouble, then why go through the effort? I was told, stop serving in the ministry. Just go get a job. Go work at Lowe's or do what you did in your counseling practice before. And I knelt down before God over and over and said, God, what is your will? And it just didn't. That wasn't what I could understand or see. 
We go back to sin. We think we don't have to fight against it. Life's going to be easier, right? Some reason that way. God will deliver you in his time if you want. Do your part, but you've got to be patient. I hate being patient. Anybody else suffer from that? Get married. We'll learn patience. All right? My wife's smiling, saying, yeah, I get that, right? About me, not me with her. God promised Abraham a son. God meant what he said 25 years later. That's a long time, is it not? So Abraham waited a year, then two. He said, I ain't waiting anymore. He tried to work it out on his own, remember? We're paying the price in the Middle East today for those activities. Thank you. The descendants of Ishmael are paying the price. Finally, God said to Abraham, wait, be patient. Another 15 years. Sarah's old. None of us are promised blessings instantaneously. We're told to serve God no matter what happens. God promises to deliver us, and he says, don't ever give up. Is the solution ever to go back into bondage? Is that ever, 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 ever the solution? To throw up your hands and say, I give up. I'm not going to follow you anymore, God. You know what the definition of bondage is? The pleasure of sin for a season. The bondage of the world is pleasurable, but only for a moment. The easy route, going with the flow. Follow your feelings, your emotions, and in this world, unfortunately, your glands. Sin is enjoyable for a while, but God says that is bondage. True liberty is coming out of sin and not ever having a penalty to pay. Let's go back to 1443 B.C. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, the time of Exodus, Passover, the first day of unleavened bread, if you study chronology, we see Israelites walk through the Red Sea, perhaps on the evening of the last day of unleavened bread. On the 21st began, they walked through the Red Sea by night. That's a variation of the Cecil B. DeMille's movie. They also came out of Egypt at night. Remember the movie when Yul Brenner, Pharaoh came back and his wife said, show me Moses' blood. And he said, this was in the movie, Moses' God is God. Now go back and do your research and find out if Pharaoh was still alive then. <laughs> There's things in the movie, it just I don't want to ruin it for you. I mean, I know it's a good movie to watch. Finally, though, they got the point. Pharaoh was alive at that point. Don't dig too deep, you'll find that. But all he said, all these other gods in the movie are not God. Moses' God has a capital G. I ask you today, brethren, how is it that the Israelites could, after seeing all they did, want to go back to sin? How is it sometimes you and I want to go back after we've been liberated from bondage? We throw away eternal life for trinkets, for things, retirement, homes. Jesus Christ cannot be sacrificed again for you. I've known friends who have served God for years and they turned around and they went back into bondage. Ezekiel said, the prophet, if you do that, then all your righteousness you have ever done will not be remembered. Brethren, rethink what happened at the Passover service. Rethink what happened with the Israelites. They were not any different than you and me. I might say, well, if I'd seen all that, well, I would fast and pray and be a spiritual judge. Some say, God, just talk to me. Tingle my spine. Show me. Convince me. It doesn't work that way. It's perfectly applicable to our spiritual lives today. We can't fail to see the lesson of unleavened bread that we will and have been observing. You are free from the penalty of sin at baptism. You must work diligently. Do your part to remove sin from your life by replacing it with Jesus Christ, God's holy character. Sin still exists. It's still there. Sin has no place in our lives, brethren. But here's what's interesting and great and fantastic. The next part of God's plan pictures receiving God's spirit. And that's the only way to overcome sin is with God. 
And that's why we eat unleavened bread every day during these days, symbolic of Christ living in us. Let's go back in closing to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. I hope this has been helpful uh, for those of you on the webcast and here. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, that, that those that were clean escape from them who live to error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, from whom man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. For after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse than it was at the beginning. It's a very graphic example. It says, do not gladly accept Jesus Christ's sacrifice and then give it all up. God likens the pleasures of sin as to the vomit of a dog. Don't get disillusioned. It's not easy. Satan wants you and me destroyed. Grit your teeth and look to God for deliverance and don't give up. You can no more deliver yourself from sin than the Israelites could have swum across the Red Sea. And brother, when the going gets tough, it will drive us to our knees. If I never eat again, I will not work on God's Sabbath. Yet some reason, ah, it's okay. I meaning if I, us, collectively. Satan's not concerned with the rest of the world. He wants you and me back in Egypt. The lesson of unleavened bread is not to give up. Don't ever give up. Think of the price that our Savior Jesus Christ paid. The author and the finisher of our faith. Please look to him constantly as you and I pursue this lifelong task of removing sin, putting him in us, and by doing so become more and more like Jesus Christ and his Father. So let's rise, please, and close in prayer. Our Father, in heaven, we come before your presence again. Hallowed be your name. Praise be your name. Father, we love you. We thank you. Bless us with peace. Bless us with strength. Live in us. Help us as we keep these days of unleavened bread and this feast day and on the Sabbath to rejoice before you. Praise you. Thank you for Jesus Christ. But realize that we must not give up. You've promised us you will never leave us or forsake us. You won't give up on us. The only thing that will keep us out of the kingdom of God and your family is giving up or quitting. Praise be your name. We love you. We thank you. We ask dismissal now, your blessing on the meal. Be with all of us, your people. Father, we pray your kingdom come. We pray that Jesus Christ returns soon and all the suffering that will be coming and is here will be ended. Praise be that day. So in his name we pray, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen.